It's Meany. Uh, dear sister, clearly it's impossible to escape fate. Uh, it seems the gods won't stop wreaking havoc on our family as our father predicted. There can only be pain left for us. And now our new king's decree, have you heard it? I've not heard anything, Antigone. Nothing good or bad since the final dreadful day of the war. I thought so. That's why I wanted to speak to you like this, uh, away from the eyes and ears of others. What is it? What news do you have? What else could it be about but our brothers? Creon has decreed that Eteocles will be given a full and proper burial, and so the gods will allow him safe passage to join the dead. But Polynices, he says, must remain a dishonoured corpse. No one can bury him or mourn for him. He is left tombless, a carcass for birds to smell from afar and feast upon. And anyone who disobeys this we put to death. And so it stands with us. Now is the time to prove whether you are worthy of the blood of Oedipus. But Antigone, this is what the king's decreed. What can we do? Just tell me, will you help me? You must decide, Ismini. What do you want me to do? Help me take the body away. You want to bury him anyway, despite the decree. He's my brother, Ismini. Maybe you think he is a traitor, but he's your brother too, and I will not let anyone say that I've betrayed a brother. You'll really defy the law of the king. What right does he have to keep me from honouring my own family? But think about our father. His fate, he was hated, dishonoured, then became convinced of his own sin and blinded himself because of it. Think of his mother wife, who went further and killed herself, and now our two brothers. Gone in one day, both the slayer and the slain. Think, Antigone. We are alone now, and won't we be the most wretched of all if we die knowingly defying the law of the king? We must obey his orders. I beg you, please don't be stupid. No. No, even if you offered your help now, I would refuse it. I'll go alone to bury my brother. And how fitting my death will be, a sinless sinner, commended by the dead. I will forever lie with them. And you can scorn the laws of heaven if you want. I do not scorn them. But I will not defy the law of the state. A weak excuse. And I will go alone to bury my dear brother. Please, Antigone, I fear for you. Don't do this. Waste no fears on me. Fear for yourself. At least keep your plan a secret. Maybe you can bury Polynices and still escape Creon's wrath. No, Ismini, you must tell the whole city. I want everyone to know my name, what I have done and why I have done it. You have a fiery soul, Antigone. But even success in this will only bring failure. Stop or I shall soon hate you. And the dead will hate you and with cause. Say I am mad, and that my madness is controlling me, that I am wrecking myself. But I know the worst thing that can come to me is an honourable death. Breaking news now, as the unrest on the streets of Thebes enters its third day. Polynices, leader of the group of rebels fighting against the government, has called on his brother, King Eteocles, to abdicate. We pray for law and order to reassert itself in our city. We'll do everything I we can. Know. We fight with the God the king has declared a citywide lockdown to last until the fighting is over and people's safety can be guaranteed. There is gunfire across Thebes tonight as the civil war continues. The city is slowly being engulfed by fighting and flames. A group of civilians have tragically... We are calling for the people of Thebes to step up and join the fight. If you're fit and able, please take up arms. The fighting in Thebes, due to a dramatic close today, as both sides launch devastating bombing campaigns on their opponents. Half the city is flattened but the government has successfully wiped out the rebel forces and today claimed victory. It is with the greatest of sorrow that we make the following announcement. King Eteocles died today after a bomb from the rebels hit the royal palace on this final day of civil war in Thebes. May he rest in peace. And we are hearing that the brother of our late king, leader of the rebels, Polynices, has also been killed today in a targeted attack from the royal forces. The royal family of Thebes have confirmed that Creon, who led the city's military through the war, 
and his uncle of the late King Aetocles will be the new King of Thebes. Good evening. Once again, the gods have righted our storm-tossed ship of state, which now lies safe in port. I have invited you, my trusted advisers, here by special summons. I remember both your loyalty to King Laius and then again to Oedipus when he restored our state. Indeed, your dedication to the royal line has been constant. Now that his two sons, including our former king, God rest his soul, have both been killed in one day, brother by brother, I claim and hold the throne by right of kinship. It is no easy matter to understand the mind and will of a leader until it is proved by him exercising his power. But to me, a ruler who swerves from their policy for fear of consequence is weak and unsuited to their position. I condemn those who put their friends before their country, and I call the gods to witness that if I believe something will harm the power of the state, I will not hesitate to act. If that harm comes from a supposed friend, I will bid farewell to the friendship if the state should otherwise suffer wreck. Such is the policy by which I intend to serve the people of Thebes. Therefore, I have issued a decree regarding the sons of Oedipus. King Eteocles, who fought with honour and in the name of our state, will receive all the ceremony befitting such a hero. But for Polynices, the exile, who returned in flames and ashes to destroy this city, I declare that none shall give him burial or mourn for him. His body shall be left in the open, his corpse meet for dogs and carrion crows. Under my leadership, true patriots will always have precedence over traitors, alive or dead. Your Majesty, your word is law. Make sure it is executed to the letter. My lord, younger men than us should enact your decree. Fear not, I have already posted guards to watch the corpse. Then what would you have us do, sir? Stay vigilant. Tell me immediately of any dissent. And release another statement. Pay tribute to all those who lost their lives and everyone who fought for us. Of course. And, sir, no man is mad enough to bring about his own death. And yet hope of gain has often lured weak men to their ruins. Um, sir, there's a message for you. Apparently it needs to be delivered in person. There's a guard who's wanting to join this call. Shall I let him in? Yes. Okay. If it's urgent. Ah, my lord. Uh, I, I will not pretend to pant and puff as though I were some light-footed messenger who ran all the way here. Truthfully, my soul, heavy with thought, made me stop and turn and turn again. Her conscience poked and prodded at my soul. Indeed, she whispered to me, Why run headlong to thy fate, poor fool? And then again, thou wilt regret for on learning this terrible news from another. So, leisurely, I hurried along. Indeed, time and distance go quickly when one has much to think about. And I had much to think about indeed. In the end, the forward voice prevailed. And so I face you now. I took a deep breath, and I said, Let the worst happen. Thou canst but meet thy fate. What is your news, soldier? Why this great speech? Well, first I just want to say I neither did the deed nor saw it done. No harm should come to the messenger. Come on, I'm waiting. News as bad as this needs a pause before it's told, sir. Then, uh, soldier, give me your message and we can all move on. Well, it must come out eventually. Uh, the corpse is buried. Uh, someone has covered it with dust and performed the proper ritual, and then they were gone. Buried? Who would do such a thing? Well, no, sir. The dry ground was hard and unbroken. There was no sign or trace of anyone. When the first century of the morning watch raised the alarm, we were all terrified. There was no signs of animals or of any creature. It must have been a human's work. And so the guards began turning on each other, each suspecting one another, but there was no evidence to pin the blame on anyone. So we challenged each other to swear an oath. 
confirming our innocence. All of us took it. We swear that we neither did the deed ourselves or know who did. Uh, but then somebody spoke up and reminded us we needed to tell the new king, uh, and so lots were drawn to decide the unlucky man, and here indeed I am. I worried from the start, my lord, of something above nature at work. But why would the gods spare even a thought for this dead man, this traitor? Why should they award him some special grace and bury him as a hero when he, he came to this city to destroy their shrines and, and, and desolate their lands? No. I have long known of those who would seek to subvert my power. My guess is that they bribed the guards and committed the crime. Money is the worst of man's evils. It is money that allures armies into attempting to conquer foreign lands, that warps and seduces innocence, and breeds a habit of dishonesty. But they who sold themselves will come to regret it sooner or later. Soldier, if the man who committed this crime and defied my decree cannot be found and brought before me, I declare that you shall suffer the punishment for this act. And a quick death will not suffice. You will be questioned by my officials until they can extract a full confession. However long that may take. May I speak, sir? Or must I turn and leave without a word? I suggest you leave. What troubles you most in hearing this, sir? Your ears or your heart? You dare make jokes. About your king. Oh, no, sir, not I. And indeed, it seems to be your mind that torments you. I'll tell you what is funny, soldier. That the longer you speak, the deeper my suspicion of you grows. Sir, speak I may, but I assure you of my innocence. Even of selling your eyes to look the other way. How sad it is, sir, when men capable of great thought should think so wrong. Go and take your thought with you. If you fail to find these traitors, you will see how far money truly takes you when confronted with death. Well, I hope whoever did this is found. But only fortune can determine that. Either way, you won't see me here again. Against all my loss of hope, I have escaped. And I owe the gods much thanks for that. Good evening. Following yesterday's dramatic conclusion to the civil war that saw the royal family retain the throne of Thebes, the palace of tonight released a statement praising what they call the wondrous nature of mankind. The king would like to thank all those who fought so bravely against the traitors and rebels who threatened to destroy our holiest, most sacred institutions. The statement continued, emphasising the toils mankind has gone through. To his people, the king says this, We've been through much together these last weeks and months. But the story of humanity is a story of unconquerable odds being conquered, he continued. The gods have once again brought a safe passage through a great tempest. We must continue to respect our gods and hold them close to our hearts. If we do so, our city shall proudly rise again. Here's the culprit. I caught her in the act. Where's the king? Um, here. I'm adding him now. What's happened? Why do you return, soldier? My lord, no man should make a vow, for if ever he swears he will not do something, it is almost certain that one day he will. When I fled from your threats, I swore you would not see me here again, but here I am, and here is my prisoner, caught in the act. No lottery was needed this time, the prize is mine by right, so take her, judge her, do with her what you will, she's yours, my lord. How did you arrest her? And where? Burying the body, my lord. Nothing more to it. Do you know what you are saying, or have you lost your mind? I saw this woman burying the body against your order. Is that plain enough? But how was she caught? Well, since you ask, it happened something like this. After I returned to my post from your awful threats, we dusted off the body and laid it back out in the open. Then we sat high on a ridge overlooking the corpse, down with the awful smell. And like this, all night we sat each man keeping each other alert and waking him if he happened to doze off, until the sun was high in the sky. Then, suddenly, a gust of wind 
blew up all the dust, creating a sandstorm that blocked our vision. It closed our eyes till it passed, and when it did, this woman stood there. She let out a piercing cry when she saw the corpse, and cursed whoever had laid it out again. Then she gathered handfuls of dry dust, and holding up an urn, she poured water on the corpse. We saw all, and swooped down at once to seize her. She stood there, undismayed, and denied nothing when we charged her with the crime. I was both happy and sad. Happy to escape your wrath, of course, but it's never nice to bring disaster onto someone else. Though truly, I believe a man's first duty is to serve himself. Speak, girl. Do you plead guilty or deny it? Guilty. I did it. I do not deny anything. Okay, soldier. Thank your good fortunes that you escaped this heavy charge. Now answer this simple question, with a yes or a no. Had you heard my decree? I knew. Of course I knew. Everyone knew. How could I not know? And yet you were bold enough to break the law. Yes. For the gods did not create these human rules. And I do not believe that you, a mortal man, can override the eternal laws of heaven with mere words. These laws were not created yesterday or today, and they do not die or expire. I fear no mortal. But I will not provoke the wrath of heaven. I knew that I must die. Even if you had not proclaimed it, it is my fate. And if this, if this now means my death is brought forward, well, I'll count it as a gain. For death is gain to any whose life, like mine, is full of misery. My fate does not appear sad, but blissful. If I'd have left my brother unburied out there, I'd have reason to grieve, but not now. The stubborn daughter of a stubborn father. Even the stubbornest of wills breaks eventually. Not only did this proud girl, well-schooled in insolence, break the established law, but now she boasts and glories in her wickedness. Who would I be if I let her flout the law like this? Though she is my niece, neither she nor her sister shall escape the utmost penalty. I hold them both as traitors and conspirators of equal guilt. They both had hand in this. Fetch as meany. Their lives are mine. Everything you say is like poison to me. In fact, I hope it will always be so. And, and I know I am no more acceptable to you. But if the people of Thebes were not all gagged by terror... I'd be glorified for burying my brother, as I deserve to be. How great the power of a king. Power unequalled and unrestrained to do exactly as he pleases. You are the only one in Thebes to see things this way. It's not true. Many think as I do, but hold their tongues in front of you. Have you no shame? Reverence to my gods and to my family may bring me no shame. Was Polynices' dead enemy, our former king, not your family as well? He was, and so he should also be buried. Then why dishonour one by honouring the other? Neither dead man would agree with that. If King Eteocles were alive, surely he would. The man he killed was no ordinary enemy. They were brothers. But one a patriot, one an outlaw. The dead to have their rights. And we have our rituals. Not that traitors should be honoured as heroes. Who knows? Who knows how the crimes of this world are judged in heaven? But not even death can make an enemy a friend. My nature is to love, not to hate. Fine. Die then, and love the dead if you must. I will not be commanded by you. Um, here comes Ismini, sir. Ismini. Another traitor just like her brother and sister. 
both of you plagues which I nurtured blindly only for you to plot against me. Do you deny this crime or will you admit your guilt? I admit to it all, if she'll let me. I share the claim of guilt with my sister. No. No, Ismini, you refused to help me. And then I refused your partnership. But now you're in trouble. And so I am brave enough to claim my share. Heaven knows well who did the deed. And a friend in word alone is no friend of mine. Sister, do not scorn me. Let me share your work and die with you. Do not attempt to claim involvement in something you had no hand in. One death is enough. Why should you die? What life is there for me without you? What can I do to help you, Antigone? You must save yourself. I don't blame you for making your escape. But you deny me sharing your punishment. Both of you are mad. Sir, when the worst happens, even the wisest lose their heads. No. Your sense left you when you chose to side with the traitors. What do I have left without her? And you would really kill your own son's bride? Yes, I would. I will. Let him find a family elsewhere. Oh, Haman, how your father dishonours you. People are not easy to replace, Your Majesty. Sir, you would rob your own son of his future wife. It is death that is stopping this marriage, not me. So her death warrant, it would seem, is sealed. Yes, by you as much as me. Take them away. Keep them prisoner. Even the bravest of spirits may run when they feel death pressing on life's heels. You do have to feel sorry for the family, though, don't you? Oedipus's line, I mean. Blessed are they who have never tasted pain, and what they have been through is far greater than mere pain. Indeed. Sadness upon sadness rains down upon them. In the days of old, some god must have cursed their line with never-ending sorrow. For now, even King Eteocles, who showed so much light and virtue and ruled this city so wisely, is gone, taken by the reckless pride which did his father. None can stop the power of the gods. Sir? It was my son. I will speak with him later. Um, sir, he's he's requesting to join this call. Shall I let him in? Fine. If you must. I shall. Heyman, good evening. I'm sure by now you've heard my decree against your bride. Surely you do not mean to rave against your father. You must know that whatever we do is done in the name of love. Father, as your son, I will always take your wisdom. Nothing is more sacred to me. Well said. Right-minded sons always defer to their father's will. Son, be warned. Do not let this woman steal away your wits. Cast her off. Let her find a husband among the dead. Let her ask the gods for forgiveness if she wants. If I should allow rebellion for within my own family, surely I would foster mutiny without. Men who rule their households wisely will prove no less wise in matters of the state. And I shall never allow anyone to defy laws or override rules. Whoever the state appoints must be obeyed in everything, both small and great, just and unjust alike. Anyone who stands his ground in the storm of battle, either king or subject, is is right and just. Uh, but any who allows anarchy to take over, what evils are not wrought by anarchy? Anarchy can ruin states, overthrow homes and foster disobedience. Well, discipline preserves order and the rank of ordered citizens. Therefore, 
we must maintain authority and not be bent by the strong will of this girl. Unless old age has dulled my wits, your words, great king, seem both reasonable and wise. Father, the gods give us the gift of reason. It's not for me to say that you're wrong, and of course I don't seek to dispute your wisdom. But wise thoughts may also come to other men, and as your son, I... I feel I should accurately report the words and the comments of the people. Frankly, those who are left alive stand in terror, and they don't just say or do anything that may offend you. But I've heard their comments, and I know how the people mourn this woman who, as they see it, is dying the worst of deaths for the noblest of deeds. When her own brother lay unburied and slain in battle, she would not allow his corpse to rot on the street. Should her name, they say, not be written in gold? I think it wise that you remember... This is what I hear. Father Tree, I, I prize nothing higher than your success. What can make a son more proud than to see his parents prosper? Just as I hope you feel about my achievements. But please don't cling to this one thought. Believe yourself correct and refuse to even acknowledge the opinions of others. Surely anyone who says that his word is wisest, and he alone can speak or, or think right, speaks only empty words. I believe that the truly wisest man will allow himself to be swayed by others' wisdom. Please relent. Withdraw your decree. If you will allow someone, admittedly young in years, to advise you, then... I would say this. It is best to be blessed with absolute wisdom. But the gods do not easily give such a blessing. All of us, however, are blessed with the ability to listen to good advice. You just have to want to. He speaks well, my lord. You would do well to listen to his advice. As does your father, you should listen to him too. You would have men of our age and rank be lectured by a young boy. I plead for justice, father. Nothing more. Wear my words upon their merit, not my age. There is no merit in allowing lawlessness. I would not ask you to rethink the punishment of those who have truly done evil. Has this woman not just broken the law? The people of Thebes, with one voice, father, say no. And you would have the people dictate my policy? It is you who I think speaks like a boy. Am I to rule for others or myself? A state that operates for one man is no state at all. The state is his who rules it. Indeed. As monarch of a desert, you would shine. You are merely defending your betrothed. Father, my thought is only for you. And yet you would argue with me. Because I believe you are wrong. Your heart is corrupted. You are a subject to this woman. Perhaps. But you will never find me a slave to dishonour. Your speech was merely a plea for her. And for you. And for me. And for the gods below. While she is alive, you will never marry her. So she will die, but... But another will die with her. What? And now you threaten me! Not a threat. Merely attempts to persuade you to abandon this foolish policy. You will live to regret this. I promise you. If you were not my father, I would say you were insane. You are nothing but a woman's lapdog. A mere plaything. Must no one reply when you have spoken. Must we all be silent? You have overstepped today. You will not taunt and contradict me without consequence. Bring her out to die now, and make her bridegroom watch. Do not presume that I will let her die in my sight or anywhere near me, and know that from now you will never see my face again. I will leave you here with your friends, who count a madman among theirs.
Sir, you should be careful. The provoked anger of youth can be great. Let him go and vent his fury like the devil. He will not save these sisters from death. Surely you do not mean to execute them both. No, you are right. Only she who touched the body. And how is she to die? She shall be taken to some uh, deserted place, and in a cave in the rock, with enough food so neither us nor the state will be blamed for her death. She shall be buried alive. Let her pray there to the gods of death, though she reveres so highly. She shall learn too late that worshipping the dead is a fruitless labour. Is Creon here? I've come to say my last farewell. My journey is done, for death who puts to sleep both young and old comes for my young life and beckons me an unwed wife. No one has sung marriage songs for me. No flowers have strewn my marriage bed, tis true where I go, tis only death I wed. Was ever there a fate like mine? I go to monstrous doom within a rock-built prison sepulchred to fade and wither within a living tomb. And all of this, payment for my father's piteous disgrace, the tainted blood that thus runs through my veins that clings to all of Oedipus's famed race. Wail and lamentation will not delay your death. Away with her. Leave her alone to die, or, if she chooses, to live in solitude, her tomb, her home. In either case, we are guiltless. I go, then. To my grave. My marriage bed. My prison hewn from the rock. My everlasting home. Where I will join the mighty host of all my family. And I hope I shall find welcome from my father and my mother and my and my dear brothers. I know I am justified in wisdom's eyes. Had it been a husband, I might marry again. Were it a child, then I could have another. But now my parents are both gone. No second brother could be born for me, and I was led by this, and judged by you, Creon, guilty of a heinous crime. And now you drag me away like a criminal to a living grave when I have broken no laws of heaven. If the gods judge that your actions are just, then I shall be taught by suffering for my sin. But if the sin is yours, may you suffer no worse ills than the wrongs you do me. Goodbye, my fatherland. Divine Thebes. I hope the gods that started this city look down on me today. The last of the royal house, martyred by men of sin undone. This is what my piety has won. Gentlemen, remove her. Um, the sentence you passed is not without precedence, my lord. Danae, also born of a royal line, was imprisoned similarly. Strange are the ways of fate. Indeed. Martinus is always punished harshly by the gods. The king of Adonia, for example, for all his taunts against the god Bacchus, drew his wrath to the city. Indeed, you might say this is all inevitable. Um, sir, the prophet Tiresias has requested an urgent audience. Shall I let him into this call? Tiresias. Yes, by all means. Okay. 
Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Tiresias. What, what brings you here? My lord, I bring advice. When you hear it, you must listen. Your advice has always been most exceptional. I have never once strayed from it. Indeed, and with it you have righted the ship of state. And I will gladly admit my debt to you. And yet, I see that once again you tread on the razor edge of peril. Well, what do you mean? These are not words a new king wants to hear. This is what my arts and all my experience of foresight has told me. I was sat in my usual spot, where I may hear the calls of the birds, and there I heard a cacophony of great noise, and at once I knew that the birds were at war with each other. The whirr of wings could signify nothing else. By this I was greatly worried, and immediately I made sacrifice on the blazing altars. But the god of fire would not appear. Instead, from the bones dripped and sputtered the ashes of a foul ooze. The fat melted and fell and left them bare. From this image, I could decipher nothing. King Creon, your temper wounds the state. All our shrines and altars are filled with rotting flesh. The food of crows and dogs. The flesh of Oedipus's unburied son. Because of this, the angry gods refuse our prayers and offerings. No birds sing. They are choked by human gore. Consider this. Mistakes are common of all men. But the man who is mistaken must recognise his error and repent and seek the cure. He who does this is not treacherous or unwise. There is no fool as great as an obstinate fool. Let death disarm your vengeance. Do not make war with the dead. What glory will you win by slaying the slain twice? I advise you this with only your interests in mind. I mean you well. I see, old man, that you cast me as your target and shoot your arrows up at me. You are no prophet. You are nothing but a peddler of lies and mistruths. That is the merchandise you buy and sell. I'll go and make your profit elsewhere. You will never purchase this man's burial. I will not commit it. No human could have such an impact on the gods. And let me advise you this, Tiresias. The fall of crafty and cunning men is great when they try to use fair words to disgrace foul treachery for filthy gain. Alas, is there no one alive who knows that there is... Is this the beginning of another profound truth? That there is nothing of greater value than good counsel. That is true. But a lack of wisdom is the worst of illnesses. Indeed. You are infected with that illness yourself. I will not trade insults with you, old man. And yet you call my prophecies frauds? I'm afraid all prophets are merely in the business of money-grabbing. Just as kings lust purely for power. Are you aware who you address? I know all too well. The Lord and Saviour of the state. Thanks to me. You are a skilled prophet. But you use what you see for ill. Take care or you will drive me to reveal the deep secret I hold within my heart. Do tell, but do not speak for your own gain. No, not a bit of gain, not for anyone. King Creon, know this. The sun will rise and fall only a few more times before you will have given your own child in payment for what you have done. Life for life. For you have entombed a living soul, tried to send the child of life into the world of death, and wronged the gods by leaving a corpse here, unburied, untouched. You have no business with the dead. You have usurped a power that is not yours. For this, the avenging spirits of heaven and hell lie in wait, and on your trail, what has been suffered by others. You shall suffer too. 
consider that. Do you still think me bought by money? The time will come soon when cries will be heard from men and women through the desolate halls of your palace and city. And rebellion, true rebellion, will rise against you. Your people will desire to avenge their fallen, mangled warriors who have found a grave only in the mouths of crows or dogs. There. That is all. These are the arrows I loose at you since you have provoked me to this great anger. Now, vent your concerns out to these younger men and learn to curb your tongue with gentler manners than with which you have treated me. I have never known the prophet's warning to be untrue. And I know it too. But he who fights with fate is often punished harshly. Sir, you must listen to this good advice. What should I do? Advise me. I will listen. Go and free the girl from her cell in the mountain, and build a tomb for the unburied soldier. That is your counsel. I should give in. Yes, sir, instantly. Vengeance of the gods is swift to overtake those who are slow to act. It is painful to sacrifice my heart's resolve. But I will do it. It is wrong to fight with fate. Go. Do not trust others. You must do this yourself. I will go. Send me some men to meet me there. Tell them to bring axes and come as quickly as they can. I will go now. It was I who locked her away. I too will set her free. Gentlemen, are you there? What news do you bring to the royal house? They are both dead. And they who live deserve to die. Who is dead? The Prince Haman, killed by his own hand in anger for his father's crime. So what the prophet said has come to pass. Queen Eurydice is calling. Has she heard her son's fate? No. You are the first to know. Gentlemen, have you seen my husband and son? Something has clearly happened, but nobody will tell me what. Dear Queen... I was there, and I will tell you every word. It is useless to decorate the truth, only for it to later be revealed as a lie. I was in attendance of the king. We crossed the fields outside Thebes to where the body of Polynices lay. We offered a prayer, then buried the mangled corpse. Then we hurried to the mountainside where Antigone was imprisoned. As we approached, we heard a shrill wail, followed by a low, hollow sound of lamentation. The king cried out, recognising his son's voice, and ordered us to double our speed that we might look into the tomb to see if his worst fears were borne out. So, we looked, and in the tomb I saw the maiden lying, strangled by a noose made of her own clothes. And beside her, clasping her cold body, Haman lay. Screaming out in agony at her death. Creon saw and approached, trying to comfort his son and encourage him to leave the cave. But Haman looked back at his father with eyes full of pain and anger. He spat in his father's face and, without a word, drew a concealed blade and thrust it toward the king. Creon leapt backwards, but but then the boy consumed with consumed with self-loathing, stabbed the blade into his own chest. Still breathing, he fell to the floor and clasped his bride. And there they lay. Two corpses joined together as one in death. It is strange she should leave without a word. I am sure she would not want to be seen lamenting her loss in public. 
she will, in privacy, mourn her son. And yet her silence makes me uneasy. Go and check on her. Here's the king. I am schooled by sorrow. I see the truth too late. Heavy is the hand of God, thorny and rough the path my feet have trod. My pride is humbled, and my pleasure turned to pain. Sir, I am afraid I bring news of further sorrow. What more pain could there be? Your wife, the mother of your son, the queen, is dead. So dead has not finished his work. What more remains to crown my agony? How? Uh, how did she die? Beside the altar in the palace, she took her own life. Having heard how her dear son met his end, she stabbed herself in the heart. So, yet again, I am the guilty cause. I did the deed. I am the murderer. I plead guilty. Guilty to it all. Come, fate. Come with all speed. Let me not look upon another day. Upon my head I feel the heavy weight of crushing fate. I pray, take me away. Take me now. No prayers now, sir. We live. And we, as the living, must now deal with the situation before us. There's no escape from that. My wife and child lie dead before me. Murdered unwillingly by my own willing hand. I am a fool. Yet my punishment for their death is life. 